Good evening. I'm Madeleine King, and I'd like to welcome you all to tonight's talk, which is presented by the Fashion Archives, of which I'm a co-director, and the State Library of Queensland as part of the Mercedes-Benz Fashion Festival 2013. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land and pay respects to their ancestors who came before them. The location of the State Library on Kurilpa Point was historically a significant meeting, gathering and sharing place for Aboriginal people. We proudly continue that tradition here today. I'll start by introducing our, our wonderful selection of panellists here tonight who will be discussing Queensland style. Um, we have here Barbara Heath, who is a self-described jeweller to the lost. Uh, Barbara's work draws on history, place, fashion, and art for inspiration. She specialises in commissioning one-off pieces and collaborating with clients to help them find their own uniquely individual piece. Born in Sydney, Heath has practised in Brisbane for more than two decades and is represented in numerous public collections. In 2005, Barbara's work was the subject of a survey exhibition at the Queensland Art Gallery. Aside from her jewellery practice, she has also undertaken a significant number of public art commissions in Australia. So welcome, Barbara. Uh, we also have next to Barbara there, Courtney Peterson, who is a lecturer in art history and theory at Queensland University of Technology, where she's been teaching since 2006. She holds a PhD in art history, exploring feminism, genealogy and social history through public installation art. Her artwork has been exhibited at the National Gallery of Victoria, the Museum of Brisbane, and in numerous art artist-run initiatives. Courtney has been writing for the Arts Press in Australia since the mid-1990s. She has been a member of the Reviews editorial team for the Australian and New Zealand Journal of Art, and is currently a board member for Eyeline Publishing and Box Copy ARI in Brisbane, and she is a co-director at Level ARI. Welcome, Courtney. Uh, we have Stephen, who is a Stephen Cameron, a Brisbane-based architect and founder of Stephen Cameron Architecture. Uh, he has received recognition locally and interstate through acclaimed built work, uh, such as his well-known light space, event space, and creative studi studios in Fortitude Valley. While working on a, a stint at a design firm, Hassel, he also led the design of Esquire Restaurant. Stephen's work has appeared in a range of respected publications, both in Australia and internationally, and he has delivered talks on a range of design-related subjects for the Queensland Art Gallery, Queensland State Library, QUT Art Museum, the Australian Institute of Architects, and the Design Institute of Australia. Uh, we have Michael Zavros, a Brisbane-based mid-career artist with a highly, oh sorry, with a national and international profile, uh, best known for his highly detailed paintings, sculptures and drawings. Zavros studied printmaking at Queensland College of Art in the 1990s. Uh, he has won a number of prestigious awards for his work, including uh, the Primavera Collex Award through the Museum of Contemporary Art Sydney in 2000 for the Kadamba Prize for Drawing in 2007 and the Doug Moran National Portrait Prize in 2010. In 2012, he won the inaugural Bulgari Art Award, an acquisitive prize in partnership with the Art Gallery of New South Wales. His resulting painting, The New Round Room, is now in their collection. He was a finalist in the Archibald Prize in 2004, 2005, 2006, 2009 and 2013. Zavros has exhibited widely within Australia and his work is held in numerous private and public collections. Finally, facilitating tonight's conversation on Queensland style, we have Nadia Buick, who is a curator, writer and researcher across the disciplines of art and fashion. She's worked in partnership with institutions and organisations such as the State Library of Queensland, the Queensland University of Technology Art Museum and the Jean Brown Group to realise fashion exhibition projects and has introduced significant national collections to Brisbane audiences, including the Darnell Collection. 
Nadia holds a doctorate from the Queensland University of Technology in Fashion Curation. She is a doctor of fashion. And she's the co-director of the Fashion Archives, our online publication that explores Queensland fashion history. I'd now like to welcome Nadia to begin tonight's conversation. Thanks, Madeline. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here tonight. Um, it's great to be here. It's a momentous night for Madeline and I. Uh, it's the launch of our online publication, The Fashion Archives, uh, which goes live in about an hour's time. It's something that we've been working on for over a year, and it's really about um, shedding a light on the rich history of Queensland fashion and dress. Um, and it's, it involves lots of um, artists, designers, collections, institutions um, from around the state. And so we thought it would be really great to come here tonight and um, ask one of the questions that's really been a driving force behind the project, and that is, is there such a thing as a distinctive Queensland style? Um, and it's really great to be joined tonight by the panellists. And um, I think we should just get right into the conversation. Um, and I wanted to start, uh, we're going to talk a lot tonight about Queensland as a place and what makes Queensland distinctive. But the other half of the question is about style. And style is something that is quite hard to define. Um, but I think it's also something that, that deserves a little bit of discussion. And so I wanted to raise the idea of style and ask how we define it. And I thought I might start with you, Courtney. I think that you're probably really qualified to talk about some of the, the messiness around defining style. Yeah, look, I think it's a really interesting question, Nadia, and congratulations on making it Thank to this you. evening. It's very exciting to be part of this and feel like we're there to, to help launch the Fashion Archives. But, I mean, style at its most basic level just really does mean that it has something, something has a distinctive character. So in its, you know, in its basic form, that's what we're kind of talking about. But the stuff that interests me about, about style, I suppose, is that a lot of my research has been looking at the way that material culture, and that includes things like dress and, um, and fashion, but also buildings and, you know, the whole wonderful kind of array of, of, of objects in the world, how they intersect with historical events, um, political events, even climactic events, if you know what I mean, in terms of, of moments of, um, of conflict, to create a different material landscape kind of um, around us, material culture landscape. And this question of style, I think, then kind of intersects. I know that it's come to mean sort of things like particular, we were talking about this before, fixed movements or um, formal, you know, kind of moments within fashion, we might talk about eras or so forth. Um, but I think what's kind of nice is if we look at style as being a kind of quite complex and messy, the way I like it, intersection of personal events, you know, social public events and the way we express those through the objects in our world. Um, and that's what I think is kind of the, the interesting question for us to discuss tonight about, about Queensland and its styles, you know, what they might be and how they have emerged, mm. yeah. So something distinctive in that mm. basic sense, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. well, I think um, the, the other sort of side of that now is to start talking about um, some of those things that are quintessential or maybe even a bit cliched that come up a lot um, in the objects around Queensland, the literature around Queensland advertising. And it's some of those things like, you know, colour, sunshine, casualness, you know, perhaps a perception of being a bit brash or uncouth. You know, and these are all things that we've probably all encountered um, in, internally, but also from outsiders as well. And I wanted to ask all of you to think about perhaps um, an experience that you may have had that perhaps reinforces some of those cliches, or maybe an encounter with an outsider who has had that perception of Queensland. Well, I know when I was a young lad, I spent a few precious months um, living in Melbourne, which was incredibly cosmopolitan for a boy that was growing up in Toowoomba, <coughs> otherwise. Um, and when we, I went to a school in Melbourne, um, I was in grade five, and it was, uh, it was a school which was just the coolest thing in, you've ever seen, because it had lockers like you saw on the TV shows, you know, the lockers? <laughs> and like, we didn't have them in Toowoomba. And, you, and they opened the lockers and the kids all had Madonna and Prince posters inside yeah. the lockers. And that was amazing. You could get a pizza delivered to your classroom. 
Um, the playground was all concrete and the weather was always grey. And, um, and when I came down there to, to go to school, they found me this sort of strange, exotic creature um, who knew how to play, I don't know, rugby. Um, and had you know, an oval at his school um, and had all those kind of luxuries that, that Melbourne kids didn't understand. And, they, and they, they mercilessly called me a banana bender, which I thought was just so unkind at the time. I had no idea that Queenslanders were known as banana benders, but there was this kind of real sense that we're these kind of ruffians from the north who are kind of out there on some sort of cultural frontier, um, living this sort of big, bad kind of, you know, um, harem scarum sort of, you know, in the wilds kind of lifestyle. So. That was my first brush against that kind of cultural idea. It's a fascinating question, though, because historically, it, it, it's not it's not sort of supported by evidence from 19th century Queensland, which is kind of fascinating. Is that what I did a lot of research over a long period of time of frontier Queensland in the 19th century, and I spent a lot of time looking at Mutterborough. And I don't know if you've had much to do with Mataburra, but you don't think of Mataburra as being a central sort of European style culture. And there was an emporium in town in Mataburra in the 1880s, 1870s, 80s, um, run by a German immigrant who was bringing in cutting edge interior design from Germany, right? The, you know, 1880s style. But, and there was a massive market in kind of regional Queensland for, for European objects. To, so this sense that, that somehow, you know, a being out on the frontier was um, meant that we were automatically isolated from culture elsewhere in the world isn't sort of borne out by the evidence. So that question of colour, brashness, what have you, what that suggests is that over time, Queensland made a choice to do that, to embrace that, rather than it being just something that was about our separation from the rest of the world and that we were naturally that it's way. How, it's how we created yeah. our point of difference. That's right, and yeah. And solved it, you know, from a tourist perspective. Mm. But I know, to sort of echo that, in collecting objects and in looking at, at uh, purchases that we might have made, it's extraordinary the sort of antiques and uh, collectibles that arrived in Queensland, mm. you tend to think, well, you would go to Sydney or Melbourne mm. or perhaps mm. Tasmania to find early pieces, but uh, people were bringing in very sophisticated yeah. um, antiques they had right through that century. They had the taste for that, mm. yeah. Mm. It's really, yeah. Look, I, I grew up on the Gold Coast and so much of what I think you were describing is, has come from, I mean, it's, it's a very obvious thing to say, but, but where it's very dictated to by our, our climate and. Um, and this, this heat that we all suffer that kind of arrived today. But um, a, a, another, a huge part of the Gold Coast obviously is surf culture and I think that that, that colour and that, that very laid back um, attitude has, has come from what was important to, to the Gold Coast and um, a kind of alfresco lifestyle and so much of I think the commentary about what happens in Queensland and is, is actually about what happened on the Gold Coast and so much of our commentary comes from interstate commentators, that's, that's the, 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 the big commentators I think are still Sydney and Melbourne with this mm -hmm. fairly one dimensional view of, about what it is we do up here. Mm -hmm. And um, I think a lot of it was born from the, the Goldie. So. Mm -hmm. And have you experienced that firsthand? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I grew up a, a wog on the Gold Coast and I just wasn't this shiny brown, you know, blonde, blonde beach boy in the Did 1980s. And I was, no, I was, I, I, we, well, I was sort of in the, the Gold Coast hinterland, but you know, 10 or 15 minutes out of, out of surface paradise, but enough to know that I sort of didn't kind of fit in this, this place that was the Gold Coast, that, mm. that, that I was a part of. I didn't sort of look like the Gold Coast, and um, it, um, I think that was my first experience of, of sort of Queensland dislocation. It's, I didn't sort of look like the place that I came from. Mm. And Barbara, you came from, well, I mean, Victoria. Well, from, from Melbourne, so I had kind of the opposite experience to Stephen. I came from the, the grid city with the grey <laughs> um, the grey skies and just as a teenager travelling to Queensland, I was really attracted to that intensity of colour and foliage and light that was so vibrant and sort of, yeah, it, it does make an enormous impact because it is pretty special, you know. I think the light is kind of the defining feature, isn't it? Because, you know, I mean, I don't know, from a... From an architect's, architect's point of view, Melbourne architects and designers are way more obsessed with colour than we are in Queensland. Um, but the Melbourne light is so much sort of softer and gentler that it doesn't, the, the colours don't hit you as hard as they do when you're, when you're 
get off that plane. Yeah, when the humidity hits you, it's like, oh god, I'm home again. There's it's enough, so bright up here. There's enough colour outside here. Yeah, too, yeah. Too. <laughs> well, I mean, talking about architecture, though, Stephen, I mean, that's probably the one discipline, I suppose, where there is this really distinctive style. I mean, we have the Queenslander house, and I wonder, um, it, do you think that the Queenslander is is distinctive? I mean, technically, is it a distinctive design? It's distinctive. It's not unique to Queensland, um, but the way we do it certainly is is unique. Uh, it's there's other examples of the Queenslander in all parts of the world. You know, through Asia, in in, in California, it was, there's a lot of theories about it being imported as a Californian bungalow as part of the gold rush <coughs> movement. Um, I mean, the, the the way the Queenslander evolved is really sort of there's a really interesting little. It's kind of like those diagrams you see where the kind of the ape sort of starts to stand up and it sits at a computer. You know, it's kind of um, the little the little English stone cottage that you could build because there was stone in other parts of, that was easy to get to. It was sort of you know, limestone and the sandstone in New South Wales. And, um, but in Queensland, there was just a whole lot of forest, and the easiest thing for people to come here and do was just cut down trees and build things that were lightweight out of timber. And they did that, and th th they took what they knew, which was the, the little English little sort of cottage, which is, you know, sort of four walls and a roof, and that's it, and then built that out of timber, and it was uninhabitable. Uh, it was just incredibly hot. It was un you know, unbelievably impossible to live in. It was, you know, there was nowhere to go when it was raining. So the veranda was added, actually added on to that as a, as a sort of an after, not an afterthought, but as an extension of that sort of, uh, and it became the key, in fact, all the only, I mean, anyone here who lives in the Queensland, and I've done it, and we've all, a lot of us have done it, would know that the veranda really is the only part of a Queenslander you can sensibly inhabit for half the year <laughs> in, in, in Queensland. Um, the rest of it's either dark and hot or dark and bloody freezing cold um, in winter. So, um, so there's definitely that. Um, but that's kind of only a, a part of the, the story of, of Queensland architecture. But it's sort of somehow it's the most culturally um, recognisable part. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think you, you're raising, we've all sort of raised the idea of climate and the way that the climate impacts us. And it obviously is this really, you know, defining inescapable thing about our lifestyles here. Uh, and I think it's very much a consideration in, in creative work and design. And, you know, when, when climate isn't considered, you know, for instance, in fashion, if you're not considering climate and you make poor fabric choices, you know, it has a direct result on, on the wearer of that garment. Um, and so I wonder how, how you feel climate has really affected um, our identity and, and perhaps creative practices as well. It's really interesting. Uh, I, I mean, there was a, a, a habit in Queensland right into the 80s of dressing to go to town, right? Mm -hmm. And I think you're right about this question about the casualness coming from coast culture because people were, um, you know, that sense of going to the beach, going to the coast was being liberated from some of these really strong um, prescriptions about correct behaviour mm -hmm. to go into town. And so a lot of you know, and I'm thinking about regional towns now in Queensland where people would literally, to go into town was travelling three blocks, but they would still make sure that they had pantyhose, um, a slip, uh, you know, completely climatically inappropriate kind of clothes on. But I think it was about holding a line about um, kind of saying that the, the climate will not conquer us. <laughs> we are still going to be nice, you know, um, which I think is a really interesting, that, and there's an extremity about that in Queensland, which I find really fascinating, that people would, and you can see photographs in, well into the 70s where people are wearing hats and gloves to, you know, for, for events that are obviously sweltering, but then they could go to the beach and they could be virtually naked. You know, and there was that sense of this kind of, the extremity of that is what fascinates me about Queensland, mm. you know, and the fact that there was correct clothes to wear to different kind yeah. of occasions. It's interesting too that those iconic images, those sort of beach images, which are, you know, if you do a Google image search of Queensland, it's it's all on the beach. Yeah. You know, the, the sort of quintessential images are, are the beach. So it's interesting that those, you know, those times when we're kind of, you know, throwing off the shackles of, you know, propriety and, and dressing in a certain way, those are the things that are really, I suppose, defining. Mm. The and funny thing with the beach, though, is that, um, I mean, this is a Brisbane experience, which is kind of a special part of the Queensland experience, but the Brisbane experience, the only beach in Brisbane is the beach at South Bank. Yes. Um, there is no beach. I mean, we've all, we've all got friends who've moved up from Sydney thinking, fantastic, I can just go to the beach, and they go out there and it's a mudflat. And, um, and, you know, so th 
Nudgy yeah. beach. Nudgy yeah. beach. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, when, when you were growing up at the Gold Coast, it, when, and when I was holidaying down there as a, as a child, it was still something that you had to journey to and do. And there was, you really would prepare yourself for that. So you're kind of leaving, you're stepping out of your normal life. Mm. And you, so it's not just, you know, you walk down the block, um, like you do in Sydney, you, you can step out of the house and you can go down to the beach and it's sort of an integrated part of your life. In, in this part of the world, you sort of have to make a conscious decision, I'm going to the beach today. Mm. And I'm leaving my city life behind and I'm going to put on some boardies and some... Well, thank God we left, we left the strictures of proper dressing behind because yes. it is really part of our style now to be so bodily free and, um, mm. you know, able to wear so much less for a lot of the year, I think. Well, it fascinated me. I thought there was some sort of strange remnant of that overdressing or inappropriately dressing for the heat in kind of um, 80s goth and swampy culture in Brisbane because mm -hmm. it was a similar sort of thing of saying, I'm going to dress yep. like the it's... The giant like it, it, you know, I'm going to wear a great coat, coat and I'm going to have yep. this incredibly elaborate makeup and, and hair that starts to sort of literally dribble down my face. And, it's, see, and I always used to sit there and say, I think that's the equivalent of my grandmother insisting yeah. Yeah. that she wore kind of, you know, corset and, and pantyhose and all the rest of it to, to the, travel into the, town. The, the structure like, of it and like the kind of effort. Perversity and, uh, or something. The control yeah. and, you know stubbornness about it, which I kind of like. Maybe that's also part of the Queensland thing. It's just you guys wearing jackets with shorts, though, so that's kind of, you know, yeah, that's right. a little vestige of that. That's right, the long socks. <laughs> long socks and shorts, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, um, something that has been coming up a little bit is um, certain periods of history and, and time, and I often think about um, the fact that, you know, Queensland is a place that has had quite a, a strange relationship to its own past and heritage, and we do have a bit of a, uh, a reputation for actually disregarding our history and our heritage, you know, knocking down a lot of our buildings. And um, I wonder if, if you think that that disregard for history and heritage actually makes it difficult to, you know, define ourselves and, and claim a distinct identity when we don't necessarily have those uh, icons to refer to. I think, uh, I think that, that there is... Um there has been a lot of loss. I'm not so sure that that's how we all feel now. I think many of us are very um, sad to have lost some of those iconic buildings in the city. And um, one of the projects that I've done in the last couple of years was research into the early tinsmiths, the colonial tinsmiths that um, were making the metal hardware for the, you know, typical Queensland buildings, yeah. and they're kind of itinerant skill sets are those sort of authentic um, aspects of our design history that I think we can assimilate or reference and have this authenticness to this place and, and style. Mm. You know, I think authenticness is a component of style, really, if you give it a qualitative thing like that. To be able to tap into those past histories, I think, is, is a growing fascination for more and more young people in Queensland mm. as well. I, I found once upon a time when I used to kind of, and I did go on a bit about how Queensland history was was a largely forgotten place. Um, you know, people would kind of glaze over. That's not the case anymore. I think people are really interested in that mm. stuff. And um, I remember it was a real revelation to me when I was looking at the history of Queensland architecture. And, and um, I, you know, I'm the, the sort of descendant of two sets of Scandinavian migrant families who came here in the 1870s as part of a program of about 10,000 Scandinavians who were paid for by the government. And a lot of them ended up in tin, working in you know, high-end sort of timber work. Mm. And when they saw a Queenslander, what they saw was traditional Scandinavian architecture. That yeah. made sense to them. So they all ended up working in kind of Cooktown, you know, from, from Norway to Cooktown, for goodness <laughs> sake, and making, yeah. you know, and, and shaping the Queenslander to f in a different way, sort of mm. that way. Some of that diversity and some of that, you know, remarkable, you were talking about when going to Melbourne and it being this very cosmopolitan city, in the 19th century, Queensland was described as dangerously cosmopolitan, you know, and, and because... Oh, dangerously cosmopolitan? Yeah, <laughs> dangerously <laughs> cosmopolitan. And because we had these big migrant communities mm. up and down the coast yeah, that were non, you know, non-British. Yeah. And um, there were days in Maryborough when a boat would come in which were, where no one spoke English. So I think that stuff is now being slowly but surely reclaimed and some of the craft practices that came with those sorts mm. of things are being understood as part of our authentic mm. kind of heritage in that way mm. and, and how we now 
tap back into that, I think, is going to be really fascinating. Just sort of exploring those conduits of, of skill sets and how they migrate, mm. um, particularly given our sort of global global labels and merchandising and everything that has changed so much in the last um, 20, 30 years, mm. uh, the sorts of products that are available in Brisbane now that weren't, mm. you, there was nothing like that in the, in the early 80s when I came here. So I think given the sense that we are losing our identity, perhaps amongst that, um, you know, amongst that marketplace mm. that uh, tapping back into those origins gives us something to gives us something to, to be mm. um, you know to create something unique here mm -hmm. <laughs> you mentioned the 80s Barbara uh, I and I, I wanted to go back to that because I think that's really tied into that narrative of you know that's that's when a lot of that heritage was lost and and that's when you came here as well and I, I wonder if you could sort of talk a little bit about that time and, and how significant it was for creative people, I mean a lot of people left, but a lot of people yes, stayed yes. as well. Well I came here in 83 and I was in my early 30s and looking to reboot my career and unaware that Brisbane was really so right for that. There was a very strong uh, subculture, art subculture here, a very inclusive subculture, probably a lot to do with the politics of the time. And for the, for the artists that hadn't left, um, they were creating uh, artist-run spaces. Uh, it was a very dynamic uh, scene that included uh, you know, artists, performers, um, graphic designers, architects. So for me, that, uh, that sort of cross-media cross exposure assisted me to kind of mature and articulate my practice across those different sort of you know, sets of friends that, that I made at that time. Um, and interestingly, that was that was quite unusual in Australia at that time. Um, Peter Anderson and others are, are currently archiving material about that decade for a show coming up at the University Art Museum. So it'll be really nice to see how young artists will um, reconnect with that. Mm -hmm. well, I think time. Brisbane, or Queensland in particular, is, is still kind of a land of opportunity. It's the kind of place you would, you would move to. I mean, there's, you know, one of the reasons it's such a compelling place to be an architect is that there's just so many opportunities to, to do work that, you know, you've got, if you, if you lived in you know, Paris or somewhere like that, you'd be thrilled to do a bathroom renovation. Um, <laughs> but, you know, in Brisbane, we have the opportunity for someone who's my age to do a, a, a tower, you know, it's, 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 it's an amazing yeah. place to be. And, and in that way, it's, it's, you know, it's sort of somehow, I'm slightly just getting back to the history question, it's, you know, it's a very young state and it, the sort of the idea of identity and history is something that's really it's it's a project that's kind of I, I feel still in its early stages and it, you get some bits that seem more settled than others but we're kind of it's we're in the thick of it and we're kind of making it right now and that's that's kind of what's so exciting about yeah about I think it. you're right there's a, a very positive flip side to this lack of identity or uncertainty that mm -hmm. is evolving it is something we can all be a part of and th there is there is much to Regret, I think, about what we what we tear down and what we what we deem unfashionable. I think, in terms of in terms of so much of our culture, but um, but it is it is also an exciting period for for something someone who is creative or, or artistic to, to be a part of that. I think so much of what you Barbara was just describing about the eighties. I think that was very much my experience in the in the nineties. It's very collegiate and dynamic, and mm. I'm, I'm not so sure about that now. I think there's not as many artists on spaces and sure how that the emerging um, circles are but um, I just I was so happy to be a part of that I, I wasn't drawn into state in, in the same way I was I really loved being a Queensland I think there's profession. probably a level of ad hoc yeah. you know That's and right. that you did, now there's probably a greater expectation for professional practice and um, you know yeah, things could just become, just happen then yeah then it's suddenly very professional and we're so, we're so again I think the internet we're so aware now Mm. You can't hide anything anymore. <laughs> you can't practice anymore. No, that's right. <laughs> Nothing is ever lost in the mists of history. It's all there for us to... But it, it's true that I remember being shocked to, in travelling in the 80s to Sydney and Melbourne and realising how much infrastructure there was in terms of, in terms of an arts infrastructure. But that could also then be um, a whole 
bunch of gatekeepers. Um, the thing about Brisbane in the 80s was it was very much if you wanted something to happen, you had to do it yourself. And that meant that people would literally say, I, no one's making clothes that look like the clothes I want to wear. Oh, I better do that. It was in it, and that was the mm, very one, much the one of uh, Debbie Fisher, Debbie Long, who was part of 2D design, a friend of mine, um, had said that back then she'd get a call from Peter Brown at the Mask, which yeah. was uh, a great clothing store, and they'd say, well, well, what have you got? We've got the magazine coming this afternoon to take some shots, and she'd say, well, we've got a few dresses, and. Um, he, we don't have any models, and so that the next five women that would walk into Peter Brown's shop would yeah. be sent up to do to, to 2D, and they, you know, yeah. the photographer, and it's sort of done, you know. And and everyone knew about what was going on. You know, it took approximately 40 minutes yeah. for, for <laughs> news to spread throughout Brisbane. That was my yeah. my memory of that is that there was a very. It, I, I, sometimes I actually have to force myself to remember how small that scene was and yeah, how intense yeah. it was and it did it did actually seem like a really long walk down to botanical gardens in brisbane like <laughs> it seemed like those blocks and blocks of not much going on so many empty buildings and in the cbd mm -hmm. and you could kind of cluster around places like the arcades where those dress shops were or the music you know the music stores and what have you they were in tiny clusters yes, tiny clusters yes. yeah it's really, and, but there was a there was what came out of that was this incredible audacity I think, and I certainly saw amongst because I was one of those people who kind of fled, but I saw amongst ex Queenslanders who went out just this incredible I think it started off as an a kind of compensatory energy about just because I'm from Queensland doesn't mean I can't do whatever. Mm -hmm. But it meant that there was also a sense of, I don't have to sit around and wait for someone else to do this. I'll just do it. Just make it happen. You know, I want to I want to start a magazine. I want to start a blah, blah. You know, people would just go out and do that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think that comes from that sense of, as you're saying, maybe a sense that it's it's a poem says that we can literally just keep, keep on writing, writing on. over. Yeah. We don't have to wait for someone else to provide that. And I think that's a residual thing, I hope that's still there culturally in Queensland. Mm. Yeah. So Michael, you never felt the need to, to leave, to get away from um, the Queensland identity? I, I, did, I did for a while, and then I, but very early on I realised that my art could leave and that I didn't have to. Um, and I, I was fortunate in the, I'd, I'd only had, had a few shows in Artist Run Spaces in the late 90s, and I was curated into a couple of good things in Sydney, and suddenly I was, became more of a Sydney artist that just happened to be based in Brisbane. And, and that was a really good thing for me. Um, because I think, at, certainly at the time, I mean, it's very expensive to be in Brisbane now, but at the time it was, it was very inexpensive to live in Brisbane and you could afford to travel interstate or to go overseas or do something like that because you were, I guess, saving money by, by living you know, up here. And, um, and it, was, it was good for me to be based up here, to be not part of the Sydney scene, which, which I found a bit, um, I've always found it a bit, a bit, um, a bit difficult to be a part of an, an art scene. I think it can be, can be really stifling. It can really sort of throw your confidence, and it's nice to, to, to be in a vacuum. Um, and I've, I've always held on to, to, to that. But did people assume that you were from Sydney? No. Oh, yes, yes, they did. When, when I, I had a residency at at, um, at art space in, in Sydney, and, and everyone that I met, because I was suddenly able to go to openings and meet people that I had been working with. They just had assumed that I was from Sydney anyway, um, and 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 the, the the surprise that you weren't from there, or I don't know. I, 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 did, I didn't know what to make. It was almost like a compliment. Oh, I thought you were from here. But, um, you seem very civilised for <laughs> someone from Queensland. <laughs> You're from Queensland. Well, you'd, you'd experience but, uh, that in Australia, but not overseas. I mean, once you go into an international <coughs> arena, you're not going to get any of that sort of um, judgment, I yeah, suppose. Yeah, I think you're right. It was relentless. Maybe you will. Yeah. When I first moved to Melbourne, I remember people kept singing to me the song that Jackie McDonald used to sing, this thing the folks had done where I come from. And they would sing that to me all the time, and I had no idea what the reference was to. And I would be there going, and I'm going, I'm looking stupid now, and someone's singing a song about being dumb, and that's not good, you know. <laughs> and they go, what are you talking And then, then they'd explain to me, you know, this sort of like, because I think for, for in that context of the 80s, it was like, Jackie McDonald uh, exemplified a certain type of bubbly, colourful, exuberant, casual, blah, 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 which they just associated with Queensland. So I, there was a lot of that. You seem very normal yeah. for someone from Queensland. <laughs> you fit right in. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> 
Okay, I want to talk a little bit more about architecture and also um, public art and how, how those things are, I suppose, um, you know, external, visible um, beacons of, of a, perhaps a, an identity. And I wondered if perhaps you could comment a bit, maybe I'll start with you, Stephen, about um, contemporary architecture in, in Brisbane and Queensland and how you think it actually um, fits or doesn't fit or is successful or isn't successful within the context of, of Queensland, climate, all yeah. those things? Well, I think it's a, <coughs> it's a broad church of contemporary architecture. It's like anything. There's, you know, um, there's, there's a general rule that 90% um, you know, of anything is not so good. Um, but if, if you focus on the good stuff, then there's some really great stuff out there. Um, you know, we, we uh, my wife Nadine and I used to live in Torbrook and Highgate Hill, <coughs> like every architect in Brisbane does. It's a rite of passage, you know, right. if anyone who hasn't done it, give it a try, it's great. Um, it's part of your accreditation, isn't it? It is, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Um, and we'd sit there uh, in the garden block, looking out over the city, and and the view really was ghastly. Um, during the day, it was just awful. You look out over the city, and it's just, it's full of the most kind of banal sort of commercial dross, really. There's just, there's, there's, a, there's some gems in there, um, and there's a lot that just isn't. And, but by night, good God, it was amazing. It's just this wallpaper <laughs> and colour and wonderful fireworks every week, apparently. It just, it's <laughs> another firework show, or whatever. Let's go back to watching some TV. Um, so there's, there's a lot of architecture that um, doesn't respond to its place, and you, and you can feel it straight away. I mean, any, anybody, you haven't been an architect to know when a building isn't really talking to the place where it is. I mean, I, I, I googled style today as a, as a thing. I thought I'd better know what it is before I came along. Good job. Um, and it turns out that style is, um, in simplest terms, a way of doing something. Um, and but that way of doing something is predicated upon the people that are doing it or that it's done for, um, which is kind of about the culture that this thing that we're talking about, whatever it is, architecture, fashion, art, you name it, is, is done within, and the time that it's done. And I think there's, you know, there's been a lot of historic architecture that's been knocked over. It was, it was wonderful. You look at all those great images of Brisbane when it was a kind of a six-story city. You know, everything was sandstone. It was all wonderful. The tram, it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. It's something, it's, it's, it looks European. You think you're looking at a, at a picture of a European city, and you would never think that today. Um, and it's not all bad. I mean, there's some good things about the way that it's, the way that it's developed. But um, I think one of the reasons why there's a lot of hang-ups about heritage architecture related to contemporary architecture is that contemporary architecture is so often not better than what it replaces. Um, and if, if that's the simple guide for is the building that you're doing now, it may be bigger, it may be taller, it may be whatever it is, but is it better? Does it talk about the people? Does it offer, give more opportunities for sort of to speak about its culture? Does it respond to its place and its time? Um, those things are all kind of complex. So um, I, think, I think Queenslanders have got the architecture of, of houses down pat. I mean, there's there's a bunch of architects um, in in Brisbane and in, and across Queensland who just have nailed um, doing a, a house in Queensland. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And what we're seeing there is kind of a, a reversion from maybe it's to do with the, the size of land that's available in houses. I don't know, but um, maybe it's a privacy thing. But we're, we're seeing the old veranda that the Queensland is stuck in the middle of the 32 perch block with the tennis court out the back, or you know, the 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 hills hoist and the and the, the sort of semi-forested garden um, is on the way out and sort of and the courtyard is on the way in which is a lot of that's to do with well the way the Queensland occupied its site was really just stick it right in the middle and then the, the site is really it's almost just sort of a practical productive kind of a thing you can have a veggie patch out there and you can hang your washing out there and the kids can get out there now they want to use their garden or the, the, the landscape space that they've got because it's a bit more of a scarce commodity so we're seeing buildings directly related to the landscape a lot better in the residential sense than we used to. Um, the taller buildings, um, they respond to so many more complex um, considerations that are to do with, I mean, their, their investments. So there's a, there's a wide range of things that where, you know, is it culturally, culturally relevant, um, climatically sensitive, it's sitting a long way down the list of, um, of considerations. And by the time an architect gets involved in a larger project, Usually a lot of the big decisions have already been made about what it's going to be, how big it's going to be, who it's going to be for, but all that kind of stuff is done. Um, you know, depends how far in you come. A lot of us joke about architects sort of gift wrapping things, um, which you know, is, is, can be a bit cynical, but it can be the way that things are done. Mm -hmm. um, but having said that, there are, there's, there's a, a whole selection of, of really 
great contemporary buildings out there that I think uh, are part of that kind of rolling project of who we are and what we're making and, and why. Um, and we, if, we, if we focus on that and, and keep on going in that direction. Then this precinct has had a huge impact, I it think, on, on certainly in Brisbane, but perhaps Queensland more generally, uh, people thinking about what public buildings can and larger buildings can do to reflect our conditions. And I remember that sense of when the Queensland Art Gallery opened, just the fact that it seemed to echo the bank of the river, the fact that it actually acknowledged there was a river, and the fact that it had l this wonderful sense of openness and light inside it. And, and the buildings that have sort of, you know, and the um, alterations to the buildings that have happened in this precinct, I think have been a really interesting example of how architects can respond on a much larger scale than just the house. Because I think you're right, I think we've been very keen to identify with the house mm. as the Queensland um, style in terms of buildings. But this precinct has, think, I think, has been the, the kind of other, other story, which has been a big success story. Well, it's, it's a classic story because it's, I mean, you know, South Bank was kind of, the, you know, after Expo, there was that the cultural fringe about, you know, oh, South Bank, you know, Rudy, you going there? Um, and it was, it was Rudy through this, you know, here's, here's Brisbane having a go at being, a, a, you know, a big city, but it really is now. I mean, it's, it's an amazingly successful tourist, and all of South Bank, you know, from the cultural precinct all the way down to the, the, the great dining opportunities that exist further down, and then the, it's, it's, it's a fantastic public place to be. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a pretty rare privilege as city dwellers for us in Brisbane to have that kind of environment. There's not many cities that have all those set pieces laid out that are effectively free for anybody to come and enjoy any time. I think also that the sorts of initiatives that the gallery have been doing, um, not just the exhibitions, but the inclusion of children into, into so many projects, mm you know, at the gallery has made them, that whole generation, so familiar with utilising and playing and being creative in this domain is, is a really good thing too. Yeah, I, I mean, part of that too is, is public art and that's something that you've had quite a bit of experience with, Barbara, and I wonder if you could comment on, you know, when you're approaching a public art commission, what are the considerations for you? Well, I think, I think you're sort of very often... Um, I think the, the very first project that I did, uh, which was um, at William Street at the Neville Bonner Building, was an, ex, uh, you know, an extraordinary experience for me to go from small scale to making a building jewel that was seven metres high. Um, and I had a lot, of, a lot of assistance and a lot of close collaboration with the architects um, for that project. It seemed to me like an extraordinary, wonderful opportunity to be someone local to make something for a building here and therefore have that sense of authenticity and that kind of coming of age of, of a city who felt, yes, we have the people here who can, who can augment and, um, uh, and create these things for, for mm. our public do you domain. Think it's, um, do you think it's nostalgic? You know, do you think we have, no, when I we think about Queensland, we have a particular era in mind, or are we a sort of future obsessed? No, I think we might, we might even, from a fashion sense, we might even be more conscious of it, uh, not to be consumed by, by a globalism. I think we, it, it might be a naturally self-reflexive thing that arises again and again under different sort of, uh, different headings or different agendas. Um, I, I think probably for, for for jewellery and for my day-to-day um, -day concerns, I think it is really important to um, to define a kind of authentic voice. Mm. Mm. Well, speaking of which, we've actually gone over time already, uh, and <laughs> uh, of course, I, I don't want to let you leave before I ask the, the clincher question, which is, does Queensland have a distinctive style? I, I thought first not, but, but the more I, I, th I thought about it, yes, it does. And I what think. is it for you? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a friendliness, and I, I'm really happy to know that it's still here. Um, a friendliness and an ease, uh, a comfort uh, with oneself, and a bodily ease, I mm. think. Mm. Courtney? Yeah, I, I think it's probably, it, is, it has become defined very much by the body. I think we have this incredible awareness of the body. I think the one thing that hasn't changed over time, even though you know the, the 
you know, I think, think what people are wearing alters and the, what the buildings we put ourselves in. But the thing that always strikes me about when people still come to visit from Victoria, they always say, Couldn't, shouldn't people be wearing more clothes? <laughs> like, it's like, it's like, I can see too much skin. And, um, you know, and I think that the, it, whether it was about obsessively keeping it kind of covered or whether it was about, you know, it was always in reference to the body and there's something to do with the climate there and that to me still defines whatever a Queensland style or set of styles might be. It must be this super awareness of the body, maybe the heat and the humidity and what have you makes us more aware of that, but that's for me the, the thing that kind of always sticks up, yeah. Yeah, it's true. I mean, it translates directly into, into architecture. There's sort of, there's a, a distinct kind of physicality the buildings that we make in, 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 in across Queensland, because they're not that different, really, at, in architectural sense, from top to bottom. Um, there's something that's elemental about just putting a big roof over your head. Um, no matter what you're doing, that's kind of all you really have to do in Queensland to, to live a happy life. Um, but the way that we craft those buildings is so much more deliberate than... I mean, look at sort of architecture from southern states, and there's, there's a lot of sort of abstract um, use of metaphor and... Um, uh, and it's sort of art historical references that are built into. There's a lot more kind of you know architecture as art rather than as a practical art, um, where there's not as much emphasis on the thing itself as in the idea that it embodies. So, whereas in Queensland, it's really the thing itself is really important. What it's made of, um, how it's how it feels when you touch it, kind of how it responds to the the weather and and, and you as an occupant being inside it. You know, build, our buildings move and they do sort of wonderful things like that. So. Absolutely, as a Queensland style. Mm. Michael? Um, I tend to agree with Courtney and, and Barbara. I think there's, we're very body conscious because we, we have our bodies out there a lot more. And, um, but, but we're, we're pretty relaxed about that. We're, we're pretty, I don't know, d d maybe not being able to, to define it, but pretty certain of who we are. I, I think we're not, um, we're not shy. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's a good thing. Mm. Absolutely. Okay, well, I'm, I'm sure that the audience is really keen to ask some questions of you all. Uh, so we might just throw over to you. There's going to be some microphones coming around. So the best way is just to put up your hand and wait till a microphone comes to you. Uh, and then we'll, we'll get through that question. And then if you didn't get, get your question asked, just pop your hand up again and eventually we'll, we'll get through to as many of you as possible. So are there any questions? Maybe they're shy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's, that's right for yourself. Hi. Um, we've heard a lot about the styles from the 80s, the 70s, and all the past styles. I'm just wondering what your opinions are of, you know, the style we have now and where we're going with our style. Do you mean in terms of fashion or...? In general. Okay. What do you guys think? Uh, I think the, the, the style we have now is, um, is a curious hybrid, really, of, of global influences. I mean, we're such suddenly global participants. Yeah, yeah. we are. Mm -hmm. And we want to be. Um, and yet, there's things about Queensland that you can't fight. You, know? mm. you can't, like, you know, you sit there looking at, at well, I'm, I'm, I even still read old fashioned media. Like, you know, when Monocle magazine drops in, you're like, wow, it's an actual magazine. Um, but there's these, there's these charming sort of, sort of scanty-looking models wearing sort of spring sweaters and, um, you know, everything looks kind of gentle. You try wearing a sweater in spring in prison. I mean, that, that stuff just... It's not possible, right? <laughs> it's not. Um, and there's the same in, in architecture. You know, there's all these wonderful ideas that look fantastic in sort of... in Denmark or, you know, Norway or somewhere like that. It's, you can really get away with doing all kinds of... As long as you insulate the hell out of the building, it's going to be okay. Um, but you try that here and it'll just, it, it just will be a disaster. So, yeah, there's, it, it's, we're lost in there somewhere trying to sort of pin ourselves relative to the world but still responding to what we've got here. Mm. It's fascinating. I think that it's almost like we're still in a moment. It's like we keep going back to these moments um, of like they were in, in the 19th century kind of going, I need, the, I need the, the German kind of furniture or the French porcelain or something. We have those kind of moments. That, that, and then it's like we're trying to fight, but where do we fit in that? And I don't think that's a process that seems to end. It's like there is this ongoing negotiation of, well, this is what it used to, like, 
you know, dating myself here, people would say, wallpaper magazine, right? What's happening in ah, wallpaper yeah. magazine? And then everyone would go, but how do you make that work here? Mm. And, and that just seems to be the conversation <coughs> we're caught in. Um, but there, but that's maybe that's that's just that's a global experience now. That's not particular to Queensland. It's not particular to that's you know us trying to work out where we fit into a global field of of objects and mm. and ideas and and styles. Yeah, I think there's an interesting um, juxtaposition of super glamour and then uh, environmentally, um, you know, correct conscious. conscious mm, yeah. um, and there's sort of like this funny kind of clash between the two that we still want to have a bit of both. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah I think that's right, actually. Mm. Yeah, particularly um, particularly in Queensland. I think Australia as well. I think Australians are quite um, keen to keep up with whatever the latest thing is. I don't know if it's as part of this kind of hangover of feeling far away from everything. <coughs> you know, uh, Australians are the ones who are buying everything online from overseas mm. and, you know, but yeah, also... <laughs> <laughs> There's this sense of sort of adaptation, I think, as well. And that's mm. something that we've come across in Queensland, where it's like kind of, you know, keeping up or even pushing the trends, but also this sort of slight variation and adaptation that allows you to actually take on board things like climate and mm. the environment. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Other, other people wanting to ask some questions? Just pop your hand up. Okay, really? No more know. questions? Oh, there's one. Um, hi guys, thanks so much. That was um, really great what you guys did for us. I do have a question regarding more specifically for the gentleman. Um, as an outsider who's not an Australian as well, I find that in Brisbane, particularly in Queensland, there is quite a like underdeveloped menswear culture. So I wanted to ask you about where the style <laughs> of like menswear so? is going. <laughs> Like in Queensland, because you compare it to you do compare it to Melbourne and Sydney, where you know men are very trend conscious, and as you pointed out, you know they're very keen to embrace like international trends and customs. I feel so in Brisbane, like that's less of a thing. I mean, definitely correct me if I'm wrong, but where do you see like men dressing and caring about their appearance heading in Queensland in the next couple of years? I think I think it has been um, historically, and I think it's 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 shifting enormously. Um, I think we, we fight our climate, we all have air conditioning now, and I think there is you know, there's sh changes in materials and fabrics and things suddenly mean we, we can wear suits and not short sleeve shirts with ties on them as men did in the, in the <laughs> 1980s. But I, I think there are some shifts, and I think um, definitely Queenslanders are, are far more relaxed and, and far more um, casual. But I, I just noticed um, differences between generations. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm Gen X. Um, tail end and well, the youngest. <laughs> yeah. um, but, but, but just the difference between my generation and Generation Y who are, who are really interested in, in fashion generally um, and the way men the way this new generation of men present themselves and behave is, is I, I think is, is was found only central only within gay culture I think 10 years ago I mean the, the kinds of things that, that these young guys are doing and it's normal and it's cool um, I, I think the role of, of men have, has changed, and I, I do see it a bit, a bit in Queensland, less so obviously than Sydney and Melbourne, but um, I think it's, yeah, I think it's conspicuous. I don't think you get, you get guys driving past in utes kind of shouting at you as much as you used to. No, <laughs> but, but, those, but, but those guys in utes, those, those, those builders or British labourers, they, they have Prada sunnies, those big wrap-around Prada do. sunnies, and this is a huge shift, you know, no one's talking about this, but... It yep. is, it Ten is. years ago, that, that would not have happened. Yeah, I think no. you're absolutely right. It's a big yeah. generational change. I have an 11-year-old son, and I listening to him and his uh, and his friends talk about clothes in a way that there is no way in yeah, a 70s playground boys would have mm. talked about clothes um, yeah, in that men. way. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely changing. Yeah, it is. It's. Um, I think it's. It, you, you can tell the way people respond to you in in the street. You know, if you. Rather than getting the kind of the um, don't people, get hit anymore. you don't get. I haven't been hit in years. <laughs> um, but you, you know, rather than people kind of sort of looking at you with a kind of like, you know, oh yeah, you know, what's with the no socks? Um, <laughs> <coughs> um, you know, it's now more curious about. Oh, hey, did you get the jacket from the cloakroom? Or you know, did, um, there's. It's more about kind of you know, hey, you know, that's where we're all going. So there's. Yeah, it's, I think it's I think that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
we, we probably have time for just one, one more question. Yeah, just, just down here somewhere. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I catch the train a lot, and it's always amazed me how there's some beautifully dressed women, and you look down to their feet and they have Nikes on, and they've obviously walked to the station, and they walk to work, and then it's all for the performance at work. They whiz out the shoes when they get to the office. And, but it just looks very discordant. <laughs> <laughs> well, something I've noticed actually lately is uh, with sneaker design, um, I don't know if anyone else has noticed this, but there's just crazy coloured sneakers happening. I think maybe that's because so many people are perhaps wearing their sneakers I, on their way I to work. I heard someone made a, make a comparison with that recently, that European women do exactly the opposite. They'll, they'll wear the heels to they get to work. Put the sneakers and on. Then, <laughs> and then step out of those into the, into the sneakers under the desk. Yeah. And, which, which I think is great. <laughs> and I think there's a, whole, there's a whole generation of women who did that s suffering in those heels all day, every day, who are now kind of telling their daughters, don't do that. Whatever you do, don't do that. So, and I think that was that was a real that was a kind of New York affectation too. It Definitely, was one of those it things. was a real like eighties in New York. Yeah, eighties in New York. And I remember that, that kind of thing of no, we we have to travel just as fast. We have to walk just as far as they do in New York. Yeah. I think it's probably because everyone's going to the gym mm. before work. It saves them having to put it in a bag. Yeah, everyone's got their fitness first or whatever backpack on on their way to work <laughs> as well. Maybe that's coming back to that idea of being really body conscious mm. in Queensland. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm afraid that we have to leave it there. We've gone way over time. Um, but thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Um, and, and thank you so much, Michael, Stephen, Courtney, and, and Barbara for a great conversation.